Wow, I am really overwhelmed by the amount of support for this session uh, and for this topic. I'm just joking. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is a tech and entrepreneur session, so let's start to have some tech fun. Can I, can I have this? So that's a little bit about me. Um, I like to say that my real job is that of a struggling author. Struggling because I love to write books, but nobody reads books these days. But I'm going to be telling you some stories about this book, which has just come out, called Sustainable Sustainability, Why ESG is Not Enough. And hopefully, we'll make links to what does that have to do with entrepreneurs like yourselves. So here we go. Let's have some fun to begin with. So here's what I'd like to do. If you would take out your phones and, uh, uh, and join this quiz with me, please. So it's a tech summit, right? Let's do some tech. So go ahead. Join the quiz. Is it working? Yes. Yeah? I don't see the, ah, there you go. I'll give you another minute. I do have a prize for the winner in the end, so. All right, shall we go? All set? Yeah, okay. So, here's the first question. How many Earths do we need to cater to current levels of resource consumption? We are 8 billion people in the world, not enough water, not enough food, not enough air. How many Earths do we currently need to take care of 8 billion people, leave alone the increasing population? And 6% of you got that right. Already we need 1.7 Earths, and they say global population is going to hit 12 billion by the turn of the century. God help us if you entrepreneurs don't innovate to find solutions to existential challenges today. Here's the next one. So Praveen, you're the own, um, winner right now, but we'll see whether you keep the lead. Here's another one. Normally, five species go extinct every year. How many times over the normal rate it is now of species extinction? So typically in history, about five species would go down every year. Now that is how many times more than the normal rate? What do you think? Take a guess. It's one of those things on the screen. Might shock some of you. And again, only a very small percentage of you got that right. It's 10,000 times the normal rate of species extinction. Have you heard of the five mass extinctions? We are in the midst of the sixth one if we don't do anything about it. And the good news is that we can. And 1% uh, of the people of the people in this world are twice as rich as how many people? We are 8 billion people in the world. The top richest 1% are richer than how many, are twice as rich as how many people? Take a guess. So the top 1% are twice as rich as how many people? Good job. This time the majority of you got it. Imagine the 1% are richer than 7 billion people in this world. What percentage of humanity, 8 billion people, what percentage of that 8 billion lives on less than five and a half dollars a day? In most countries, consuming living on less than five and a half dollars a day is impossible. And a good number of you, only 11%, got that right. But it is half of humanity. Income inequality, that is the gap. Here's my favorite one. How many rich men in this world, we were talking about women in the previous session, 
how many rich men in this world have more, more wealth than all the women of Africa? This one is a shocker to me personally. How many rich men have more wealth than all the women of Africa put together? There are 56 countries in Africa, by the way. You ready for this? 22 men put together are richer than all the women of Africa. We've been celebrating, yesterday I wrote an article for the Deccan Herald about, about women, about gender equality. Okay? And it is absolutely impossible to imagine this. Absolutely. We've been celebrating International Women's Day. How old do you think International Women's Day is? Anybody? Since when have we been celebrating International Women's Day? Anyone? Take a guess. 10 years? 15 years? 100 years. More than a century we've been celebrating International Women's Day. And yet, this is the situation. So folks, we don't get it. We just don't get it. How often does a cyber security attack happen somewhere in the world? This is a major cyber security attack on a company. The answer is, you got this one right. Every 39 seconds. Here's another one on this. How many computer files are stolen every second? Now this is your and my files included. I'm almost at the end of the quiz, and then I'll give you the story, okay? Uh, but bear with me for just a minute. In, my pre in the previous conference I spoke, I was keeping 15 seconds. They said increase it. Now 30 is too much, right? <laughs> okay. 44 files per second. And how many dollars are currently available in so-called ESG funds in the world? Do you know what are ESG funds? This is cheaper capital available to solve for uh, climate change, socio-economic inequality, and cyber vulnerability, and those kinds of challenges. Cheaper capital, ESG funds. How much money is parked in ESG funds around the world? By the way, they say you need about $50 trillion to meaningfully reverse climate change. That's the number by the World Bank. How much of that... Of Money is currently parked in ESG funds. Actually, the number is 43 trillion as of yesterday. That is one third of total assets under management, my friends, in the whole world. 43 trillion. And they say we need 50 trillion to reverse climate change. So that's good news, right? Because it's growing at 12% Kager. No, it's not. Here's the question that I, that's not in the quiz. How much of this 43 trillion is actually going towards climate action or social action, do you think? It's money meant to go towards climate action, social action, cyber action. How much of the 43 trillion is currently be actually going towards that? What do you think? Anybody? Sorry? Maybe 1% is right. Hardly anything. It's all in interbank trading. Suddenly, how did we have 43 trillions in ESG assets? 10 years ago, nobody was talking about ESG, right? They're just normal funds re uh, earmarked as ESG again, and box checking is going on. So, my final question. Are ESG and current, other current situations adequate and meaningfully reversing climate change, socioeconomic inequality, and cyber vulnerability? All the things. Everybody's talking about sustainability, sustainability, sustainability these days, right? Yeah. Is it going to be enough, the current efforts? I'm glad 100% of you said no. Because absolutely not is the answer. So, uh, just a minute. So, Anir Ban, where are you? Okay, see me after the session and I will give you your, uh, your prize. Although it may not be much of a prize, it might be disturbing. But anyway, thank, congratulations. So, my friends, the good news is that everybody is talking about the fact that we need to do something about these challenges, right? 
uh, what most people don't realize is that we live in a world that is in which everybody is completely naked. You, me, our organizations, everything and everybody is totally naked thanks to digitization, right? Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to two more things. There's a lot of talk about purpose these days. You need to give up some profit in order to get, go, go for a worthy purpose and don't just be greedy for profit. I would like to reject that notion. If we are going to save this world, we are going to save it with profit. Okay, so profit is not a bad word. More on that later. And finally, ESG is going to solve our problems. No, my friends, these notions, which are very popular these days, I am going to debunk them to you in the next 20 minutes. Stay with me. So, the front runner solution for all our existential problems, and we have less than two decades to save the world, otherwise the planet may not survive, okay? And I'm not over exaggerating. Uh, the front runner solution amongst all the solutions is ESG, ESG, ESG. But the need of the hour is to make money by addressing those very challenges that threaten us. In other words, the need of the hour in business, whether you're an, a startup entrepreneur or whether you are an established entrepreneur, the need is to do well by doing good. Question is, is it possible to drive profit by pursuing purpose? And I'm going to try and prove to you that yes, you can. But if you think about it on the day you start your startup, Somebody I met the other day, and I started to hear, yeah, what's your new book about? I said, it's about sustainability through business. And he says, oh, sorry, I'm an early stage startup. This is not for me. Talk to me five years later when I'm generating cash. Wrong. The best entrepreneurs are those who think about it on day one. And everybody was a startup one day, all the big companies that you see today. And the best ones, from the Tata's in India, to the Wipro's in Bangalore, to the Ayala's in... Uh, in the Philippines to Patagonia in the, in the, in the, in, in the Americas uh, to Faber Castell in, 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 in Germany, they were all startups one day and they thought sustainability on the first day and they've been surviving for 200 plus years. That was the secret of their success. So don't tell me that you're going to talk about this after you are successful. No, no, no. If you are a genius, if you are a genius, then tell me that you accept the 21st century leadership challenge, which is to make money by addressing the very challenges that are threatening us today. That is the leadership challenge of the 21st century, my friends. And I will show you that it is possible. Okay, here's another quiz. This CEO provided 290% return to their shareholders over their 10 years as CEO. Okay, uh, they did it by creating a sustainability-based business plan, double the growth, half the negative impact on the environment, and triple the positive impact on social. And they did not do it under any regulatory pressure. Who is this? Anyone? Big multinational company whose products all of you use. Big, huge FMCG multinational. Any guess? Sorry? Well, you're almost there. It's actually Unilever, not just Hindustan Unilever. Okay? Unilever under Paul Polman's time. 290%. By the way, in the first two years, stock price tanked. Okay? Profitability tanked because he got out of very profitable lines of business because they were bad for society or the environment. But the board supported him and that's when the magic happened. In the first two years, 75% of his top management team quit and left. This guy is going to drive the company to the ground, they said. But he hung on. He hung on. 21,000% stock price appreciation since IPO uh, in 1992. Fortune's most admired company for 21 years now. Uh, and they focus on the S, the social aspect of ESG. They provide full healthcare benefits even to part-time workers. And they are spending more money on benefits than they spend on raw material. And they've been doing it from day one since they were a startup. Today, they're a massive company. You see them all over the world. Who is this? Hint. In India, they have a partnership, a joint venture with the Tatas. Sorry? This guy was a son of very poor immigrants in America. Okay? His father was a temporary worker, had no medical insurance. When he broke his leg, he couldn't get me medicines. He couldn't get treatment. They couldn't eat dinner at night, sometimes the family. And he said, I will create a company my father never had the chance to work for, where everybody gets full healthcare benefits. He didn't think about it after he was successful. He thought about it on those early days. In business and doing profit uh, and profitably growing for more than 155 years now, uh, average age of a company is only 18 years. And this 
conglomerate has a footprint in over 100 countries and 66% of share capital is owned by philanthropic trusts. Their motto is we make money so we give it away. Which conglomerate is this? Sorry? Absolutely, it is the Tata's. Well done. But we are talking about sustainability today. Look what Jamshedji Tata said in the 1800s. In a free enterprise, the community is just not another stakeholder. It is the very fact why we exist. From day one, my friends, I need you to rethink what success looks like in a startup. I need you to rethink what entrepreneurship is all about. Okay? And I will give you the formula in a minute. Here's my favorite and last story. The picture you see here, this one, of scorched earth, is the golden triangle, the, the border between Myanmar, uh, Thailand, and Laos. Okay, 30 years ago, uh, this independent, heavily armed militia was controlling the villages in that region. There were only two, two professions, prostitution and, and drugs based on opium uh, cultivation. And massive deforestation was taking place because they were growing opium, right? There were no hospitals, there were no schools nearby. So if you felt sick, the only medicine was opium. So there was heavy duty addiction as well. If you did not go into one of those two, two, uh, two professions, you would be beaten up mercilessly. All right? One day, the Thai princess mother arrived in a helicopter and said, no, I reject this notion. We see a better future here. She challenged her team uh, to do something about it, her foundation, that is. 30 years later, my friends, this is what that picture looks like. I was there very recently with my research team. Uh, and this is a, one of the stories in our book, Sustainable Sustainability. And the same impoverished villagers who were being beaten up into sex, trade, and, and, and drugs every day, today run and own highly successful, highly profitable businesses in coffee, macadamia, handicrafts, fabrics, tourism. Uh, and they are a global People come from all over the world to learn sustainability and uh, circular economy from them. Uh, I take groups, so study groups there. Next group I'm taking there is in November of CEOs from around the world. Uh, I take 30 people at a time and we show them what sustainable business, profitable, how profit can solve today's problems. Amazing story, also in the book. So in case you're interested and if you want to talk more, talk to me after the session. And for all these great stories, there are also the villains. You all know about the Dieselgate scandal, right? What happened in 2008? Guess what you don't know? This was not the first time they did something like this. This was also not the second time they did something like this, my friends. This was the third time they did it. I, for one, will never buy a Volkswagen or a Porsche. I used to own a Porsche when I lived in New York. Okay, a nice uh, 911 Turbo. Never again will I touch any of these vehicles. Third time? How can you trust them? Spread the word. <laughs> and then you've heard the story of uh, Theranos, right? Erica Chong, who used to be the, who was the scientist who broke the story, a young Berkeley graduate who broke the story. I interviewed her uh, on stage last year. I said, you were a 22-year-old something. Weren't you scared? She says, yes, I was under surveillance. They gave me all kinds of threats. My parents told me to back off, but I said, no, I, I cannot let people die because of wrong tests, right? Uh, so if you look at all of these, we can create a spectrum of environmental and social ambition. And you need to think about this no matter which stage you are in, in your business. Uh, green washers or purpose washers, they profit from today's challenges. That's Theranos, that's Volkswagen. Uh, blissfully ignorant, what climate change? What socioeconomic inequality? Even if it exists, it's not my problem. I pay taxes, let the government handle it. Window dressers. Oh, everybody's talking about sustainability these days. I can't be seen as not doing anything. Let me do a little bit so people think I'm doing a lot of great job. People come to conferences and give speeches. Okay? They dress up their windows. All form hardly any substance. Box checkers. Because there's a lot of regulation these days. So I don't want to go to jail. I'll do exactly what the law says and no more. Okay? Check the box. And then you have the true champions of environment and society. They are profitably solving these problems. They create profitable solutions to today's challenges. And those are the examples that I gave you. Right? The question is, how do you move more organizations to the right? Yeah? How do you create, move more? To answer this question, uh, I want to ask you guys another question. What is common amongst Enron, Theranos, and FTX? You all know FTX? 
Yeah? Sam Bankman Freed, he's now pleading to please give me a shorter sentence. I, I screwed up. Yeah, please, 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 mercy. What's common between them? Anyone? misaligned ethics you said what else what else anybody what was the board doing I'll give you a hint misrepresentation of fact what was the board doing so that's the hint as to what was what was common between these three sorry turning a blind eye basically poor governance isn't it wherever in the world I ask this question ladies and gentlemen the answer I get is they are a result of poor compliance poor diligence poor diligence and poor governance right and if that's the response, what do we normally do? We have more rely, more governance, more compliance, more rules, more regulations, right? Oh, let's make sure this never happens again, right? Let's have tighter rules in this, that, and the other. That's our only response. Yeah? Not going to save the world. It's not going to save the world. I met a very interesting guy a few years ago. His name is Andy Fastow. Anybody know Andy Fastow, the name? You all know the name Enron? He was the last CFO of Enron, who was the mastermind of all the corruption that was going on over there. And he spent six years in jail. He came out close sooner than his uh, colleagues because he became a prover, right? And he had a lot of time to think in jail. So he wanted to write a book and tell people what not to do. Somebody said, talk to Rajiv. Rajiv writes great books on leadership and you guys will write a great book. So I spent two hours with him talking about what the book would look like. Here's what he said to me. Many people believe Enron was a failure of compliance. I disagree. What Enron was, was a culture failure. It was a culture of loopholes where the principles didn't matter, only technical adherence to the rules. He said, we showed the world that you can create the biggest corporate fraud in history without breaking a single law. They went around it. Ultimately, they all went to jail because the, but the, the intent to defraud was confirmed. Not because they broke the law as such. Okay? Now Andy was on the, on, the, on the speaker circuit and he would start with uh, showing a picture like this. He would stand on stage like this. He said, I got both these things on the same year for the same deals I struck for Enron. This, he said, is my CFO of the year award for the most innovative financial deals. This, he said, is my prison card. I got this in January, I got this in May for the same deals. Right? So, my friends, if we think more governance and more compliance is going to save us, God help us. We asked a bunch of boards all over Asia, how do you spend your time? Okay, and this is what came out. More than 60% of the time goes on financial performance, regulatory compliance and risk management. And we just replicated this study all over the world. Same data, even in America, even in Europe. We asked the board members, what do you, are you spending enough time or less time or too little time on each of these activities? And this is what they said. These are the things that we don't spend enough time on. Today, the only source of competitive advantage is your culture. And we don't spend any time on it. Sustainability is the biggest problem of our times and we don't spend any time on them. Is governance, is G, the e, G of ESG going to save us from E and S challenges? I get it. You, the entrepreneurs, will save us, if at all. Here's the problem with governance. We focus only on these three things. Okay? Yes, regulation is important. We need laws for civil society to function. Okay? But here are problems with Regulation sets the minimum standard of good behavior. If you do be below that, I will send you to jail. Just because I don't break the law makes me a good person? No. There's two different things. Right? So regulation only sets the minimum. Regulation may preserve present value but does not enhance future value. What we need to solve for today's challenges is huge amounts of innovation. Innovation cannot be legislated. And regulation is usually reactive. When things are screwed up, then regulators come in and let's make sure it never happens again. Too little, too late for the people that already suffered. Then they say, Oh, it's about measurement and incentives. What gets measured and incentivized gets done. You've heard that before, right? Famous management idiom. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. When you focus too much on measurement-based incentives, when me as a CEO, my bonus is linked to some ESG scores, what do you think I do? 
It's not what gets measured gets done, my friends. What gets done gets measured in a way that makes me look good. I hire an army of people whose job is to create data and measurements that make me look good. So I can get the highest bonus. I did so much for society. Yeah, right. We've known this for 45 to 50 years. There was a very famous article, the world's most downloaded management article that ever came out 45 years ago, but if you read it tomorrow, it's like it was written today. It's called on the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B. Where they show that the more you measure, the more bad behavior you create. Okay? Let me give you a fun example. In basketball, the teams that win more than others, the most winning teams, what is the core skill and competency for winning more games than losing in basketball? What do most winning basketball teams do better than other teams? Anyone? They play better together. Yes, yes. What's the activity? You're on the right track. Teamwork. Teamwork. What does teamwork look like in the middle of a match? Passing. Passing the ball. Okay? The more you pass better, the more you win better. Right? How does the NBA draft players for professional basketball? On what basis? What data are they looking at? Exactly. On what? Shooting scores. So if I am playing a match and I want to get drafted, do I pass or do I shoot? On the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B, my case about measurement, driving bad behavior, rests, my friends. So, we ask people, the true champions, these guys, right? What motivates them the most? What motivates the Tatas, the Vipros, the Patagonias of the world to do well by doing good? Is it measurement and reporting? Is it compliance? Is it tax? Is it cheaper capital? Or is it something else? 92% of my global database in 25 countries chose number 5. They don't do it because of regulation. They don't do it because of incentives or cheaper capital. They do it because they want to, because they want to leave the world safer for their children and because they want to leave a legacy. So, a few more minutes to finish. Uh, I'll skip this, but I already told you 92% of the people agree with it. Uh, it's not just leadership. What you need is steward leadership. By talking to 100 companies who are doing well by doing good, we, all the research is in the book, uh, we learn that what these people do is practice steward leadership. What is steward leadership? It's two words, stewardship and leadership, right? Let's look at that. Leadership is usually seen as somebody as a CEO telling people what to do. Black suit, usually a guy, do this. I ask people, you know, define leadership and they say always, anywhere in the world the definition comes up in a room like this. Leadership is the act of coaching, inspiring, guiding, uh, motivating, directing, dissing or batting people towards achieving some common goals. Meaning leadership is what you do to other people? No, Gandhi didn't do anything to other people. Mandela didn't do anything to other people. George, uh, uh, Martin Luther King didn't do anything to other people. Whatever they did, they did to themselves. And what, was, what came as a result was inspired followership. So my friends, that definition of leadership is outdated. We, the leadership uh, definition that is evolving now is leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a better future. You don't need direct reports, you don't need title, you don't need capital. You need a burning desire in your heart to create a better future. Then you are a leader already. Similarly, stewardship is seen as a steward on a plane who serves you coffee or somebody who takes care of our money. Outdated definition. The definition of stewardship today is stewardship is creating value by addressing the very challenges that are threatening us today, by integrating the needs of stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. Not just the shareholder or the promoter, but by everybody. So steward leadership is a combination of leadership plus stewardship. We borrow from the definition of leadership and say, steward leadership is still the genuine desire and persistence to create a better future. But we borrow from stewardship and say not just the future for shareholder, a collective better future. The, G the challenge of 21st century leadership, my friends, is this. Do you want to be a steward leader? Will you make pots of money for yourself? And God bless you, I hope you do, by solving today's challenges. That's the genius I'm looking for. If you're making billions of dollars and doing a crypto platform, I'm not impressed. So what is steward leadership? Very quickly, two, more, two or three slides more. Three simple steps. It's not rocket science to understand. It's easy to understand. What it needs is determination from day one. Step one. And we learned this from all the great steward leaders we met and, and, and watched. The stories that I told you. 
The first is we find that they believe in four specific values. What are those four values? Interdependence. I believe the more I do for society, the more I will succeed in my business. They strongly believe that. The more I give, the more I get. Long term view. There may be some short term cost, but in the long term, I'm going to be super successful. Ownership mentality. I choose to be a steward leader. I want to make money not by screwing the world, but by solving the problems of the world. That's how I want to make money. And finally, creative resilience. I will find the innovation and I will keep struggling until I find it to find profitable models that help me make money and solve the world's problem. These champions, they believe in these four values. Different words, but that's the essence. In Mars company, one of the companies we studied very closely, they don't call it interdependence, they call it mutuality. And they have a whole uh, uh, sort of a text on what they call economics of mutuality. How the more you focus on society, the more you make money. That's step one. Step two, now you define clearly your stewardship purpose, which is the better future you want to create. Pick one area, some part of the environment, whether it's food, whether it's water, or inequality, or something. There are 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Pick one and make that your center of your business model. Focus, focus, focus. And step three, Everything you do now, every decision you make as a company from day one goes through the lens of your steward leadership compass. You ask yourself, are we in adherence with these values? Is it going towards our purpose? If not, revisit. Day in and day out, that's what steward, leadership, steward leaders do. And there are plenty of examples of how they are making money and making the world a better place. That's the challenge. So I will skip this. These are some tools that we have which are detailed in our literature of how to measure yourself if you want to be a steward leader, etc. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts. Governance uses the power of rules and threats and carrots and sticks. Steward lead leadership uses the power of purpose, values and profit. Profit is not a bad word. So. We are recommending that the moniker ESG be upgraded to ESL, where L stands for leadership, specifically steward leadership. Does your organization have a strong compass of stewardship values and purpose? Is the compass used to guide decision making at all levels or is it just a beautiful poster on the wall, which it is in most cases? And most importantly, do you have innovation engines in your company to solve for E and S? That's the essence of what I wanted to share, my friends. Today, uh, I want to leave you with one last thought before I open it up to questions. The day you begin to think like a steward of planet Earth, think of yourself as a steward of planet Earth and humanity, you pivot from seeing sustainability as a cost problem to a leadership and growth opportunity. This book is available outside for sale, but I don't recommend you buy it unless you have a strong heart because it will disturb you to think differently and if you start thinking differently you will have to act differently so buy it at your own risk it's available outside with that i will open up for questions what questions do you have for me thank you very much anything that i made confusing anything that you would like me to address any lingering doubts still in your head as to what is he talking about yes ma'am I'll give you a mic. Hi, how's it going? Um, so my research is focused on investments and how investors make decisions. So the narrative within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I, I completely agree with everything that you're talking about. There's a massive change in the way that entrepreneurs are choosing to solve problems. The challenge actually happens when they go and try and get investment. Because right now, the way that the entrepreneurial ecosystem measures success is whether you are a unicorn or not. And the way that the finance is being structured is all about extre extreme growth rather than being able to figure out how to do something that is blended finance or purpose and profit. So I'm wondering what your uh, thoughts are around the way that capital is structured, as well as how do you navigate that as someone who is uh, wanting to be a leader in sustainability, but is faced with the way that the current capital works. So you're raising a very pertinent issue. Capital as a force of good is a huge problem. Okay, I already showed you $43 trillion in ESG funds, not even 1% is actually going towards E or S, right? The only form of capital, the only two forms of capital that are actually making a difference. 
One is, there are certain places where commercial capital will not go, so you need some philanthropic capital to get started. So the best uh, asset owners understand that. And then the ones that are having an impact on profitable are, is impact capital. But any other form, asset management form of capital, absolutely not. Unfortunately, the financial industry has a long way to go on this, and I don't have a great answer. Uh, it's a huge problem. I work for one of the largest sovereign wealth funds of the world, and I can tell you we are trying very hard to change the thinking. It's a long haul. Uh, I believe I'm allowed to take only two or three more questions, so who else has a burning question? We'll get to you, we'll get to you next. Go ahead, go ahead, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Shivi. Um, so, as a, uh, you spoke about uh, steward leadership and all that, um, so I do understand as a leader, probably I believe in uh, sustainability and I would like to carry forward, but how to make the same concept believable to all the people who are ah. in, in my team or who is going yes. to work along with me for a longer period of time. Yes. And that's not yeah. that easy to give yeah. the same yeah. mindset. So somebody said to me in a conference where there were 500 people in the room just the other day and said, Rajiv, aren't you naive? You're talking about this goody tissue stuff. How can you convince everybody to become a steward leader? Human beings are wired by greed and personal interest. Okay? And short termism and you're talking long term, you're talking about giving rather than taking. Are you naive or what? Nice fellow Rajiv, but this is not true. Here's the good news, ma'am. You don't, I agree that 80% of the people will not buy into what I'm saying. I, am, I can give it to you in writing. 80% of the people will do the opposite of what we have discussed today. But that's no problem. All we need to convince is 2 out of every 10. And we will save the world. We definitely will if we get to 20%. Why am I confident about the 20% number? Have you heard of a guy called Wilfredo Pareto? The Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the people create 80% of the magic and that has not been debunked for 106 years. That mathematics is still valid. 2 out of 10, start with yourself. Convert yourself first and maybe one person will follow you and you are done. That's all you need. Last question, yes sir. We'll take one last question. Yeah, hi, my name is Mustafa and uh, we have a tech startup uh, based out of Pune and we have a, a headquarters in Istanbul as well. So we are a legal tech company and uh, yeah, can you hear? Okay, so we are a legal tech company based out of Istanbul with an office uh, development center in Pune. I want to know like how, like you mentioned like very big use cases, very big companies, but for a small startup, like a budding startup, 50 to 100 people, how do you apply these kind of sustainability rules or how do you approach speaking to your team and you know, like delving into these principles, like steward leadership? I think part of the question was asked by her, but how do you start? How, uh, how do you start what? Uh, this this approach, like steward leadership in, in, in a company, as in a small company, like applying these principles. It starts with you making a decision that you want to be a steward leader. It starts with me. I want to be as rich as anybody else. I'm convinced. How do I convince others? Then come up with an innovative model and show people that if you come with me, not only will we save the world, but we will make also money. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Amazon did not pay a cent of prof, uh, dividend for 20 years. How did, how come no in investor deserted him? 20 years of no money? Because he convinced them that if you stay with me, you're going to make more money than ever seen in history. You've got to come up with that strategy. Then convince people. That's how you do it. Sorry. Okay, so I believe I've been running out of time. <laughs> so I will not uh, let you uh, this thing, even though we were quite behind. I just want to share one more thing with you. Many of you are doing great work. We recognize the 25 best examples in Asia Pacific of anybody solving a problem of environment or society profitably in Singapore. You get invited to Singapore, you get recognized. Uh, case studies are written by INSEAD and us. If you know of it, go to this uh, site and apply. It costs you nothing and you'll get a lot of reputational capital. Secondly, we have a website like a Wikipedia called stewardshipcommons.com. If you have something to say on this topic, become a contributor and people can use your knowledge all over the world for free. We don't charge a cent for this. So, uh, if you are an entrepreneur that has an idea and you're doing something profitably, nominate yourself for getting recognized. You will get a lot of reputational capital. And if you want to consume knowledge or share knowledge, join stewardshipcommons.com. Thank you very much. You've been, it's been a huge pleasure. And thank you.